Okay, good. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, desktop accessibility, as you see, and a thing called UI automation, which probably none of you have ever heard of. I'm also going to try and impress you with the open office transition, so you enjoyed that one. Um, excellent. So uh, you may have noticed or not that uh, we recently announced another collaboration with Microsoft. Actually, it was tacked on right to the end of a press release, which no one read. Um, so maybe you didn't notice. But anyway, it turns out Microsoft is, uh, we're collaborating with them to provide uh, UIA, which is um, UI automation, I guess this is what it stands for, uh, which is a Microsoft API on Linux. And this is what various people say about it. Uh, this one is worth, well worth listening to. Yuni is uh, a lovely, lovely lady. And she's been involved in Linux accessibility for a long time. When we announced it, it was a bit sad because we knew they were setting up this industry association as well and would make it even better than it was. But basically the punchline is that uh, Microsoft is disclaiming all of their patent rights on UIA. That's at least the business rationale. And putting it all under the OSP. Better than that, they're setting up uh, this body, which has several working groups in it. Um, these working groups. <coughs> And all of the output of these working groups is also going to be covered by a, effectively a covenant not to sue. So we can work to merge the Linux infrastructure with Microsoft and take the best bits of either of them, standardize it all in here, and bingo, we're done. So there's lots of companies involved, Adobe, you know, these other people, Oracle, you know. But yeah, I guess Microsoft is, is leading it at some level with Adobe and uh, an IT vendor. There are loads and loads of AT vendors, and AT is an assistive technology, for those who don't know. People who make braille displays, people who make uh, software like uh, screen readers and so on, um, to make computers accessible. But basically we want to drive convergence. You know, it's a relatively small space, with relatively little investment in it, such that it's possible to know almost everyone who is everyone in accessibility and get them in a room and not have many more people in this. So, you know? It's, it makes no sense to have multiple competing APIs and you know having to choose which one to implement and you know the net result is clearly you know worse accessibility and wasting actually relatively limited resource pool uh, unnecessarily so it's a good thing so I'm going to try and talk you through briefly the various different designs in this space for doing accessibility and how they differ so this is the existing Linux accessibility stack. And you'll notice at the bottom of it, we've got a whole load of Corva IPC interfaces. And these are defined, and you know, it was thought that it would be a good idea to standardize the IPC. I think that's actually a terrible idea. But at least, you know, there is a language agnostic uh, IDL uh, language you can do that in. And it looks, like a, it looks like a good idea to start with. So, you know, well, whatever. You've got to work with something. I think it's better to uh, standardize at this level, uh, the ATK level. Uh, and get you know, interfaces that can be, can be wrapped there, and then hide the IPC so you can optimize it, cache it, and rework it later. Um, you see, virtually everyone is using ATK unless they're using Python to go directly through Google. It turns out that there's some really beautiful Python bindings that just make it very easy to write screen readers natively in Python. And of course, the Java people go directly, they've got a, a, their own orb, so I guess it's kind of you know, attractive for them to, to bind that natively, and so you've got Java. Java accessibility. This is the new story. Of course, before uh, Fell, I guess, invested in, in moving this here, but OpenOffice used to sit on top of the Java stack um, that used to map between OpenOffice accessibility and ATK, which made it horribly slower and uh, yeah, really disastrous. So anyway, that's, that's where we are at the moment, and it works pretty well. I'm not going to do any demos, just so you know. Um, but you know, the, the punchline is that you can use your screen reader, and you can introspect your widgets, and Virtually everything is accessible. There are increasingly few things that you can't uh, do, which is, which is good news if you're impaired. So hopefully the, the other thing you notice about stack is relatively simple. There's a nice bus topology at the bottom, and you know things talk to each other uh, fairly normally. This is the uh, this is the UIA uh, overview documentation of the simplified architecture that they have, and. Uh, Clearly Microsoft have got a long legacy tail of compatibility and they have to work hard to make sure that they don't break stuff and so on. But here's basically how it works. The process boundary is much less well defined in, in the Microsoft world, simply because the IPC here is really not very good. Um, it doesn't perform well. The interfaces are not very, you know, not suitably granular for doing lots of IPC. And so consequently, um, broadly, I'm trying to try to see... Broadly, application writers and AT writers, who are maybe on this side, um, yeah, they tend to shove a whole lot into the application itself. <coughs> ah, I forget. 
I, I can't understand the picture myself. But either way, they, they take their code and they go and shove it and export it into other applications where it can run quickly and it can use the native common interfaces. And then they can control the IDC themselves going to their screen reader, say. And so that's nice. And of course, they can add all sorts of other components into the process. So say if it's Microsoft Office, they can add things that understand the DOM. Uh, and they can get all sorts of other different bits of information they can grope around inside the application. They can even use you know, programming APIs that are exposed by various applications, say so Excel or something, to you know, get even more information and then crunch this all together, shove it over a, an IPC, a main pipe or whatever, and, and talk to their screen reader. And that's broadly how it works, how it works today. Um, UIA, of course, uh, aims to throw away much of this stuff in a nice new clean API. So, hiding behind this picture here, out of proc MSAA clients, okay, that's the screen reader. Aha, out of proc UIA clients. So this is where you should be, basically. So you then have a very nice uh, API that is UIA based, that is maybe much more, uh, much less granular, so you can do, you know, sort of more advanced constructs and reduce the IPC round trip load, so you can start to do a lot of this stuff without needing all those horrible hacks in the same process. And so it's, in theory, it's nice. It's a beautiful architecture. Right? I, I really like it. And interesting, you'll notice that uh, th this guy here doesn't really need to know about all of this mess here. That's, that's the other thing. So from an API perspective, they get quite a nice clean API here. It's all the evilness is hidden from you, including all sorts of bridges that convert the old API to the new API in various pieces here and so on and so on. So in theory, the new, new API is, is really a huge step forward. In practice, of course, if you'd invested millions of man hours in making this old thing work and all of your business value was in defeating the you know the demons of complexity that were there before uh, you can understand that someone else doing that for you might not be you know, perceived as threatening so anyway that's just uh, an insight that might be helpful so into this this mix uh there is also a thing called iaccessible too this is created by ibm and it's very interesting so Microsoft have uh, an interface called iAccessible on their platform. <clears throat> and as we explained, iAccessible has a number of problems. And it's not as rich and functional as it could be. So IBM essentially embraced it and extended it. They created iAccessible 2. And unfortunately, in COM, you can't really do interface versioning except by appending a number. So hence, iAccessible 2. And yeah, they just inherited from this interface and then added a whole load of new stuff that was good. You know? And people want it. And so, uh, so that's fine, so they've got an interface, but of course interfaces by themselves are not extremely useful. They're like, I guess, document file format specifications by themselves, they're not that useful. You can prop the door open with them or not, depending you know, how lengthy they are, you know, so you should get more pages in so you can uh, you know, hold the door open. Um, but you really need software that implements it, right? Um, so you can go read the interfaces here, but, but more than that, IBM encouraged sort of seeding of this, this industry, uh, and they took I guess what was the open office Uno APIs, which are very similar to the Java APIs, very similar to the ATK APIs, there's also sort of family there together, and they, uh, they brought them to COM, and then they implemented them in Lotus Symphony, which is, for those that don't know, a fork of open office based on open office 1.1 that is slowly going to get resolved in open office 3, hopefully, 3 something, probably. And they paid the major creator of screen readers in the world on Windows to also implement support for their API. And they paid other people inside IBM, um, Aaron Leventhal, who's a very clever guy, to implement support for Firefox 3. So suddenly there's actually applications using this, and there's actually screen readers using it as well. But of course it's very nice and incremental. Of course if you don't implement iAccessible 2, that's fine, just fall back to your old code that uses iAccessible. Uh, and you can, you, know, you can query interface for it, it's either there or it's not, you can extend your application. So, so there's but of course, there are still some pretty horrible, horrible design you know, problems in it, as we saw on the previous page. Probably it doesn't change you know, the, these nasty proxying problems and you know, all of the evil that lives under the sun. It doesn't make it much cleaner, but of course, it fixes many of the, the problems that um, you know, uh, UIA is designed to, uh, to help with, arguably. So, yeah, so there's an overview there. Huh. So, what is our end goal? But based on this, what we're trying to do is we're trying to move UIA to Linux, <coughs> and we're trying to clean up, I guess, some of the stack at the same time. And, you know, from our perspective, uh, it's interesting accessibility. IPC is, is fun, you know, getting, getting a beautiful infrastructure is, is good. But we have something that works, and we don't want to subvert that. It doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, let's build on top of it. 
So the new stack repos clearly leaves existing screen readers, talking to Python, all of the existing applications. And then initially in the first phase, uh, we're going to be adding um, this UIA provider API. So this is an API that allows you to um, uh, make, add extra accessibility hints to your widgets if you implement them yourself. But better than that, we're going to be implementing it in WinForms. So WinForms is, I've got some pictures later of what you can do with it. But it's, it's, it's sort of a legacy toolkit um, that's, that's positionally laid out. And it's not particularly wonderful, um, but it's there. And people write little applications for it. And if you've written it for Windows already, you'd really like to just move it over to Sutter and run it. And it just works. And it's just accessible. So that's basically the first, first phase of the project is to do this, this piece of the stack. And that will mean that using your existing Orca screen reader, hopefully, you'll be able to talk to your WinForms app. Ah, raw, excellent. This man is the D bus in the uh, in the uh, ads by D bus here. Yeah, you might say call the raw D bus. So, yeah, you can have either yeah. if you pay raw. So yeah, there you are. Um, so that's good. And uh, so in the second phase of it, having having done, I guess, arguably the most most useful piece here, uh, we're then moving on to doing the client piece. So you could, in theory, run your own AT. I just shut the door. Do come in. There's another door up the back there. Oh, I don't think I'm welcoming you now. Anyway. So you can write a client then using this, this managed thing and hopefully ship it between Windows and Linux. Um, I think that's probably slightly less useful, but in a completeness of view, it's quite nice. And the other thing is that if you look from a social conscience point of view out there in the world, um, ATs are extremely expensive, like you wouldn't believe. You know? You've heard Microsoft Project costs, I don't know, you know thousand dollars, but ATs are really, you know, in another league for, for charging people who are in pay. You know, it's like some pension providers, you know? They like to steal money from retired people who aren't retired yet, you know? It's a wonderful, you know, you get a huge lump sum when you sign up for a pension. It's like thousands of dollars, and that's all taken from your pot, you know, uh, in, in, in a long time. But, but anyway, not to malign them too badly. They're wonderful people, and they're involved in the AIA. So, so where was I? Oh, yes, but if you could write a nice, simple AT that covered, you know, some 70% of the needs across the market, it would be interesting to see what would happen there, running it on Windows and Linux and so on. So maybe, maybe that's interesting. It's not something we're interested in, but it's a free software project. That would be, would be quite neat for a lot of people. And so then finally, there's uh, I think Moonlight, which is implementing uh, Microsoft's silver light-ish stuff. Uh, again, on top of Mono, and that needs to be accessible. Um, so we'll be working on that too. So, so, so what's the next thing to do? <coughs> so why bother? All right, yeah, all right. Ah, so. Here we have uh, a couple of WinForms apps that are absolutely indispensable, yet another calendar. What the world needs is another, another calendaring application. That's why I discovered this when I talked to Sun, and they're investing in Sunbird instead of Evolution on Windows, which is tragedy. But anyway, and, and here's another chess game, yet another chess game, but all of them written using uh, WinForms. And generally, as I say, it's small vertical apps, right? It's really irritating if you can't use your silly expense filing system or your silly CMS front end, or whatever it is that's being written on Windows and you can't get onto Linux to, to run, particularly if you're impaired. You know, it's just another level. I mean, we're all used to not having hardware drivers that do proper 3D, right? I mean, that's just normal, you know? But it's not such a huge sacrifice if you can't actually use your computer at all to do, you know, various things. And so hopefully as we fix the, you know, we're missing Flash and we're missing this and we're missing that and the media codecs, we'll also be fixing the it's also an accessible problem. Uh, which is nice. Here's another paint.net application. I don't know. I don't know that that's particularly useful to a strongly impaired person. But <laughs> anyway, Silverlight is uh, yeah the next thing. So this is again Moonlight running a Microsoft demo app. You, you get things, flashlight at some level, and uh, yeah, they work. You need to be able to book your flight in your web browser with the ridiculously pretty graphical thing that someone someone created. So I've nearly finished, which is good. I, there, there are no questions so far. We're all sitting there very cowed. So I'm going to heckle. Come on, we need heckle us. Okay, well here's the timeline that I was drawing in the back and didn't quite finish, but uh, the punchline is it, it falls neatly into two equal parts, like this. You know, so the first year we do something, and the next year we do something else. So uh, first of all, we're starting off with the UIA provider and the WinForms implementation, as I was saying earlier. And uh, we'll be shipping it first on Sled, but we'll be then moving on to package it and ship it for Ubuntu and Red Hat, which is interesting, so it will be everywhere, as it were, and you know, doing QA and bug fixing in the last quarter. And similarly, in 2009, there are various stage milestones and demos for you know the various conferences that happen about here and here. Um, one of the interesting things is that Moonlight is not actually uh, Silverlight 2.0, as I understand it, is not finished yet, including the accessibility portion of it. So, in fact, 
you know, we'll be starting to, well, I don't know when it will be delivered. Maybe it's delivered somewhere here, but we're not far behind, right? We're starting to, uh, to really invest almost ahead of the curve there and getting the client done. Actually, another interesting thing that follows from that, uh, that, that rather complicated slide I was showing you back in the day um, is that our implementation will, um, will, of course, be using native managed code for everything. Let me try and, uh, let me try and get back to that, back to that, because I can ramble about it for a while. Um, so, our implementation of this will be broadly, let me try and think which bit is happening. So this is an improc proxy for user 32 and common control uh, things. So when you create a WinForms, um, a WinForms application in Windows, I'm sure you don't want to know this, but you will in a second. What's that? Oh, first of all, opening the door for now. So um, it turns out that things like the, the top level window in what you see as a single application is implemented in the kernel, or nominally the kernel, and then some of these controls similarly live in you know other places, but then other more complicated controls maybe you know or, or, or whatever doing trees are implemented in a different process again, and they all live sort of all over the place. And so in terms of implementing rich new accessibility APIs for this sort of thing, it's kind of a real problem, and particularly because what you can do in the kernel is somewhat limited, and what you can't do in you know, this kind of things. So behind what looks like a rather simple, not very good-looking user interface, there's just this mess of infrastructural compatible legacy uh, stuff that we don't have at all. In fact, our implementation of all of this will be in native C sharp. Um, and so it's entirely possible, and you know, in some corner cases, that by the end of 2008 we'll have a better implementation of uh, common controls or WinForms uh, with regard to accessibility than our, our competitor, which would be quite nice. I at least would be pleased. Um, so yeah, so here's the conclusions. Accessibility is coming of age. We have been hiring, if you are very interested in accessibility and you're knowledgeable about it or something. I don't know if you've got any slots left, to be honest. Calvin is running the project. Um, and really, I think, with this, oh, there's still a couple there advertising for. Absolutely. So if you, you, know, if you have a, an urge to do all sorts of funky C-sharp, you know, IPC, you know, ATK, you know, toolkit stuff, then, you know, uh, do see me. Uh, but I think really Linux, you know, accessibility is coming later, and Linux is going to be really the best platform to do accessibility on. It's going to have beautiful Java integration, it's going to have high performance office integration, it's going to be, yeah, it's just wonderful. All the APIs will be there, your, your application will just just work. Okay. So, yeah, in terms of credits, Marco Scambrax really owns this space inside SUSE, he's been yeah, doing all, all manner of great work for, for years, particularly on the console, before any of the graphical stuff happened, writing anything called SUSE B Linux. Which you know, it, back in the day, allowed you to just boot and install, you know, using using a braille display and so on, for many years. Sun, of course, did huge investment here to bootstrap the accessibility uh, work across the desktop and the office suite and, and the, the web browser as well. I think uh, similarly, IBM, you know, with their cunning ploy uh, around iAccessible too, and uh, you know, just encouraging all this openness to actually happen. And the AI, I think they they have a lot of credit. Uh, of course, the people in Microsoft for you know actually doing the right thing, I think, starting to open up, uh, making their specs available, starting to address pattern concerns around them, um, you know, starting to work together with other people, and you know, surrender some of the control, and things like the AIA. Um, and yeah, Calvin is leading this, leading this thing here. So you can find out more about it here. There's all sorts of nice links, and you can talk to people. And there's pretty pictures of Calvin driving through mud in his four-wheel drive vehicle. So. Yeah, go and see it online. I think that concludes my talk. Are there any questions? So with a hat, with that hat. Um, how how would um, the A11Y um, project influence the likes of, say, Adobe, mm -hmm. uh, with regards to Flash supporting sure. um, Greenfield 2 um, for like, video over web canstring web flash because mm -hmm. um, currently it only supports V4F which most modern webcam drivers right. don't support well in flash. Yeah, that is an interesting question, not one to which I know the answer. Since I know relatively little about flash and relatively little about that, I don't know, it's really sort of more of a moonlight question now, I guess. But I'll, I'll just make up an answer anyway, just to help you. So I think competition is, is good in this space, right? You know, it, it's clear that you know 
not having I accessible to and, and seeing it in the marketplace galvanized people into action and started them opening up and creating alternatives. And you know, similarly, Moonlight, I think, is, or Silverlight is, is clearly behind in the rich web client space, but it looks like it's going to be the first free software, fat client, you know, rich web app infrastructure out there. Now, that is amazing. If I told you, you know, two years ago that Microsoft would be funding the first open source, you know, fat client, you know, web app, you would have just laughed. It's just a, it seems ridiculous, right? Still might seem ridiculous too. But anyway, it is actually happening. So, uh, you know, so the thing is that things change and when companies do funny things, you know. Uh, you, you look at the list of companies here and you can think of instantly some really good things they've done and some really stupid things they've done, you know. And that uh, I think it's, it's worth judging what they do by how they do it and not, you know, not judging them simply by a brand, you know, big is bad and, you know, if it begins with N it's bad and if it begins with S it's perfect and, you know, this kind of thing. Um, so, so, yeah, I think it's a complicated space for them. And we'll see, I think the whole world is going, ultimately, I think the whole world is going open source. And, you know, we're going to see a, you know, uh, you, can, you can laugh, but I, I think it's true. And I think uh, we're going to see a huge amount of struggle and heartache and pain as, as big companies try and change their culture and learn to understand what it means to work with other people and to really open your, your product up. And to, to do that, and, uh, you know, it's going to be a, a hell of a ride for the next few, few years as big, big companies get involved. And, you know, I would love to see this turning into a free software company. <laughs> At least. More so, they say. Yes, sir. Um, a lot of applications nowadays are just normal web apps, as in not only kind of silverlight, moonlight, flash, yeah, yeah, yeah. jit on the screen. Um, <laughs> the, how you mentioned the Firefox 3 accessibility. Is that a kind of, as in the application has accessibility? So say you go to the preferences dialog and that, is that made accessible or is it the pages? Um, how does that fit in with like a bigger picture outside rich client That's a really good question. So yeah, is it just the, is it the content inside or is it thrown around the outside of both? And the answer is both, clearly. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's no good having the, the, the documents accessible if you can't change location. So yeah, no, it's both. There are a number of interesting complications with JavaScript applications and the creation of very beautiful looking, you know, responsive, uh, asynchronous Java and XML stuff inside a document and making that accessible in a meaningful way. Um, and this whole thing called WebARIA, which is trying to standardize this, or there's a group in the W3C working on that, um, and lots of interesting work going on, much of which I don't know anything about. So, but you, if you search for WebARIA, um, you'll find out a whole load of you know, But it's coming. It's coming pretty soon. How am I doing for time? Excellent. Okay, any more questions? No rotten tomatoes for me? Come on, someone has got a headphone. No? Okay, well, thank you very much. You've been very patient.